Michael Crawford uh, songs that we sing here before. One of the songs that Michael Crawford sings, and I'm, I'm going to, it's not a singable type of song, but I'd like to put the words up. It's from Jesus Christ Superstar, and it's called Gethsemane, of when Jesus was struggling in the garden. And one of the lines in the song that Crawford sings is, I must go back now, and I must finish this job that I started that you started, you know, and, and he makes this point, and at the end of the song, he says, you better hurry up and get this over before I change my mind, and it's a very human approach and a very understandable approach, but this here, the second coming of Christ, is a fundamental belief. Now, the gospel stories, as you've read them, and as most of you were trained in, in your Christian walk, were that Jesus Christ was the one who was going to overthrow the Roman Empire. That's what the belief was. He was to destroy the Roman Empire and set up his own kingdom, kingdom of righteousness. That's exactly what the, the storyline has us to believe that Judas thought. But there's always been that. There's always been in the history of religion, no matter what religion it is, an expected Messiah who would return from a heavenly domain and, and do good on earth. And that's, that's always been that way. But there's a grave error committed by the people who interpret the scripture literally. I want to show you what it is. Take a look at page 801, those little Bibles that you have. And it's Matthew chapter 24. And uh, if you would look at that, Matthew chapter 24 on page 801. And if, I hope that you can see this. Uh, that's a board. Page 801, Matthew 24 and verse 3, okay? Now, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Let's look at that. Sign of your coming and end of the world. Okay, that's, what it's, that's what's written in your Bible, and as you look at that, you can see that. But in 1881, there was a group of scholars of divinity who went into the King James, took a very close look at those words, and then followed the actual Greek. They produced a rendering which is quite different. And when you get done taking these words and translating them as they really are supposed to be, there's the change. Instead of the word coming, it is what will be the sign of your presence and the end of the age. Quite a bit different. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? The Greek word parousia, P-E-R-O-U-S-I-A, does not mean coming, although it can be used as arrival. Its prime meaning is presence. What will be the sign of your presence? Okay. The Latin that's used is presentia, which is definitely presence. So the actual translation is, what will be the sign of your presence? The end of the world, the word is suntelia, which is S-U-N-T-E-L-E-I-A, two O A I O N O S, which means the completion of the age. So then we have a different story. What is the sign of your presence, and what will be the sign of the end of the age? Okay. Because what's, what we have to understand is the ancient philosophies, and we are watching another tape tonight that dealt with ancient philosophies, the key of the ancients is built around the human race evolution cycles of time. Everything in a circle. Everything begins, comes down, goes through the bottom, raises itself back up in a great circle. That's exactly what the, the life story of Jesus Christ is. That's exactly what the sun is. The sun comes down and goes through the Southern Cross during December the 21st, goes into the tomb of the earth for three days and three nights in the winter solstice. December the 25th, it starts its journey back upward. Jesus Christ came down from heaven, went through the cross in the tomb, went down to set the captives free, and then resurrected back up. Everything is exactly the same. It, follows that great cycle pattern as all ancient stories did say. The birth of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the birth of the Son, the resurrection of the Son, all of these things are part of, excuse the word, myth, but nonetheless it is. Um, on, they had this fellow on television tonight showing graphic evidence that the uh, movement of the children of Israel out of Egypt never happened. Never happened. 
There's not one record of 600,000 people leaving Egypt. There's not one smattering. Nobody kept records more brilliantly than the ancient Egyptians. They wrote everything. Nothing ever happened to that. But that, doesn't, that should not in any way challenge you because what we're looking at is the way Eastern people write. They make a graphic story. They use Egypt as the place of the lower mind. They use that, that those slaves who are in the bondage to the lower mind, breaking from the, uh, from the, uh, from the um, Pharaoh, which is actually the ego, coming out through the darkness, wilderness of meditation to that which the struggling, churning emotions of the Red Sea, looking up and crossing the emotions into that which is the promised land of the right hemisphere of the brain. That's what they're trying to... But what happens? We look at these things, we read them as if they're history stories, forgetting they're in a Bible. There is not history stories in a Bible. The Bible was not meant to be a history book. It's a mystical, spiritual book. Strange stories, allegorical stories are told to you so that you can look at them and say, what is being said here? And what was being said here is the exodus is not from a country named Egypt, but the exodus is from that which is the domain of the lower hemisphere, the left hemisphere, the left hemisphere of the brain, to that which is the right. Basically, that's what we're talking about. So, after reaching the lowest, the spiritual aspect is found. When the sun comes down and is at its lowest point during that which is the winter solstice, it then starts its upward arc moving upward, and the cycle is completed. Later stages happen, but each stage or age has man picking up a little. That's the same as your life. You come down to this earth. Your body starts to wear itself down. Some of us are going into the fall of the life. You, know, you notice that you're in the fall of the life as you look in the mirror and you see that some of the leaves are starting to fall off the tree. <laughs> Where well, have all the flowers gone long, you know? You realize that. And then, of course, snow begins to fall. You might have to go out and buy a little tube of something to, you know, get rid of the snow, if you understand what I'm saying. Not preparation. I hate to use other stuff. <laughs> okay? And so then you realize you're at the winter of the life. And then finally, you know, you succumb and the branches fall. But voila. As we said and this, I think, is the most graphic evidence or beautiful way of simile of speaking of it. You are not the light bulb that carries the light. You're the light that the light bulb carries. And all you need in order to get the light back. Isn't that amazing when you think of that? You know, the more I think of it, the more I look at that, that light in there is always the same. It, is, it doesn't change. The bulb changes, not the light. No matter how many bulbs you break, no matter how many places, if you take this bulb out, and take it on a plane with you and fly to California and screw it in a socket, the same light is there. It doesn't, and if you don't have this bulb, you leave this bulb here, but you go to California and you look at another bulb, inside of that bulb is the same light that's here. And so what happens? When your bulb goes, they give you another bulb, they screw you back into the power, and there you go. That's all. What's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with that. That's a beautiful thing. And, of course, that's the renewal process. I mean, you know, you, you get old and the body wears down, you get a new one. You see it with your cars. How many cars have you taken to the junkyard? Has anybody ever gotten rid of an old car? Nobody. You've still got all the, you've no doggone well. You've all gotten rid of your old cars, but look at here you are. You kept rowers, right? No, I got rid of them. <laughs> but everybody gets rid and you keep, because you're always here. The driver doesn't go away with the old car. So Christ is an earthly manifestation of divinity, going down into the tomb and then rising from it. The sun goes down and rises from it. We start to go down and rise from it. So all the ancient books speak of the ending of one age and the coming forth of a new age. Where are you right now? You are coming through the ending of the age of Pisces and the beginning of the age of Aquarius. And that's what's beautiful about it. See, you and me, the same, the end of our age, the bodily destruction, the saving of the advanced spirit, and the initiation of a new age. So the question is, in Matthew 24, 3, when shall these things be? Come on with me now. Let's go. Let's get into the nitty-gritty of this. Let's answer the question, the second coming of Christ. When shall these things be? What is the sign of your presence and the end of the age? Now, are you what? Did you see what he said? Don't go anywhere. And we're looking, when is this going to happen? How will we know? How will we know that your presence is reestablishing itself 
and that we are at the end of the old age and moving into the new. Okay? Here's his answer. Page 859. Let's go to Luke chapter 22. Page 859. Luke chapter 22. With me? Uh, here's the answer that Jesus gives about the end of the age and the sign of his presence. In Luke chapter 22, go to verse 10. Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he enters. And then he goes on to say, and he will take you to a large upper room furnished there. Make ready. What's he saying? He is saying, at the time of the water man, the age of Aquarius, you will enter into the house, into yourself. You will go to the upper room, which is that higher realm of consciousness. There it is all furnished for you, nothing for you to bring, nothing for you to do. There, make ready, and I will meet you and sup with you there. There's his answer. This is it. Oh, you say, well, maybe you're wrong. Oh, maybe I am wrong. Well, maybe I'm right. Huh? What if I'm right? Do you see some evidence in the newspapers and what's happening around the world that there is a change coming over planet Earth? I would think so. If you haven't, then you haven't been tuning in. Certainly there's a change. There's a global change. There's a tremendous change. There's a change in the way you think. There's a change in the way you feel. There's a change in governments. There's a change in the way people respond to governments. There's a change in the ecology. There's a change in the entire environment of the world. There's a change in Mother Earth. And what did he say? He said you would see the change when the water man comes. The water man is here. And you go into that house and go to the upper room. And he says, that's where you be. He shall show you. Look at Luke 22, 12. He shall show you a large upper room furnished. There, make ready. Do you know that you have two upper rooms, two rooms in your, in your brain? One is a small room. One is a large room. The small room is 10% of your brain, the left side. He said, nah. The right side is the large room, and it's all furnished. He said, it's all equipped. It's all ready for you. All you have to do is be willing to go there, make ready, and I'll meet you there. Now, you could say, oh, he, this, you're not taking this literal. He meant there's a man carrying a pitcher of water. No man in that part of the country at that time would be caught dead carrying a pitcher of water. Women carried water, not men. Never would you see a man carry a pitcher of water. There's only one man carrying the pitcher of water from the ancient scriptures, and he sits in your sky right now, starting to pour that beautiful stardust twinkling down upon the earth, and those seven billion crystal magnets are starting to move within your brain and start to communicate with he who is the Christ in his second coming of this new age. So they asked him for a sign. They said, hey, we've got to be able to find you. How are we going to find you? And they said, what's the sign? What's the, what's, what's the evidence of, of the new age? What's the evidence of your coming? And he said quite clearly, the man with the pitcher of water. Oh, my God. Go get a map of the stars. Go out there and look on the wall of the big map of the stars we have that lights up, and you'll see them pouring the water. And what's he pouring the water for? For the great wedding feast of Gaia and Uranus. Hmm. So the age is the age of Aquarius, the man with the pitcher of water, the second coming. Now what about your presence? Let's go the age, so we could put it here, Aquarius. That's circumstantial evidence, but I, I think there is enough going on to say that something cataclysmic, something cosmic is happening today in the world. That's okay. I mean, you know, you're sitting, up, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a riot when you think of this. Look at how quiet we are, sitting with our arms folded, aren't we? Very quiet, sitting with our arms folded. Do you realize how long ago was it that Ronald Reagan was on television talking about the evil empire? And all of the evangelists were on television saying, oh, you know, they're going to come with their guns and bombs. The Soviet Union. It doesn't even exist. Ask, tell me, has there been any changes? Let me ask you, what were the chances, would you say, say, a couple of years ago, of saying that you would be sitting here now and there would be no more Soviet Union? It's gone. Gone away. Boris Yeltsin's over here trying to get into a set of pizza stands and uh, Sony and all this. What, is, what happened? Where did it go? Cosmic. A cosmic event has happened. It's the age of Aquarius. Because what happens in the age of Aquarius? Uranus is the planet of spirit. Chasing out Jupiter, which is the planet of wealth and discovery. 
You spent the age of Pisces was the discovery of the ages of all of the material things, electricity, airplanes, computers, and all of these things, money, banks, investments, stock markets. But you know what's happening now? Jupiter is being chased out of the temple by Uranus. The money changers are being chased out of the temple, so it's a fit place for God. And all of the discoveries and all of the changes are coming, are coming to that which is spirit. And everything which has been taken away from the poor and the oppressed is to be returned. That is going to be interesting. So what did Jesus... Let's, let's, we've got the age of Aquarius. That's okay. Okay, that, you're, you're willing to go with that. But what about the sign of his presence? He says it's going to be in the age of Aquarius, but what about the sign of his presence? Take a look at page 853. It's only a few pages from where you are now. In Luke chapter 17, and let's see if we can draw some evidence concerning that. All I'm asking you to do is not make up your ideas or opinions or follow a group or a tribe or a denomination. I'm saying you look in the book and reach a conclusion on your own. You say, well, I mean, I don't know if this... Okay, you don't, but it's, 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 it's pretty good. You know, it's, it's a pretty good statement. He did say when you see the man with the pitcher of water, it's in the Bible. Take a look at Luke chapter 17. We're talking about his presence. Okay, and look at verse 20. The, uh, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered and said, quote, the kingdom of God comes not with observation. What he is saying, if you need it any clearer or more literal, is you can't see it with your eyes. Do you know that the basis of fundamental Christianity is that he is coming back and they are going to see him with his, uh, their eyes, and the man has said, and it's written in red here, it doesn't come so you can observe it. You cannot see it with your eyes. Now, he's, does he explain how come you can't see it with your eyes? Yes, he does. The very next verse. Neither will they say it's here or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So there goes the entire basis of the foundation of fundamental Christianity. Through the words of Jesus Christ. So he is saying presence. But what about, so let's ask this guy, Jesus. Well, wait a minute here. You're saying, you know, you're coming back, but, 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 but now you're telling us that we can't see you. Well, how the heck is this going to be? I mean, what's going on here? What about you? I mean, you said the kingdom is within us, but what about you? Where the heck are you? Okay, let's see if we can find something. Go to page 880. It's the book of John. And turn to John chapter 14. And the only way that I can stand up here and say these wild things that I say is if you've got a Bible in your hand and you look in that book and see it written with your own eyes. Otherwise, I have no right to say this stuff. And I am not standing and I have never stood up here and said, well, in my opinion, I think this. I haven't said that to you because that wouldn't be fair to you. What I've said to you is I have found this. Take a look at it and see if you see it. You make it. You make a decision, not me. I can't make a decision for your life. So where did Jesus say he would be? We said, he said as far as his presence is concerned, you can't see it. So his second coming is going to be a, a coming in which it's not going to be visible with the eyes. Okay, so where are you going to be? What the heck are you doing here? Page 880, John 14, verse 20. At that day... You shall know, I am in my Father, you in me, and I in you. Is in your book? It's in your book. Okay. Now we're getting pretty close to the second coming, aren't we? At that day you shall know he is in you. You can't see him with your eyes. You can't see your liver with your eyes, for God's sake. But he's in you. And so, if you're going to look in the direction where he is in this second coming. So now we have two things that we've come up with here. First of all, the age of Aquarius. Second of all, that his presence is going to manifest inside of people during the age of Aquarius. There's going to be a change in the way people think. And, and of course, you're seeing that fulfilled. You're not, you don't have to read about something that happened in the Old Testament. I'm saying to you, pick up the newspaper that you, know, you got yesterday or today. Read about it. Turn on the television. Read about it. See the things that are going on in the world and say, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe this is being fulfilled. You, you're, you're the people of the Bible now. In other words, it's in your lifetime that this is happening. Judas, not Iscariot, asked Jesus a question. You're on John 14, 20. Look at 22. Judas says to him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself unto us and not unto the world. You know what he's just saying here? How, no, wait a minute. He, he's a way, whoa, Jesus, wait a minute here. You're saying, you know, I mean, how, how could this be 
that you could make us know that you're here, but yet it wouldn't be apparent to other people. I mean, what's going on here? What the heck are you talking about? Watch. 1423, Jesus said, if a man loves me, he'll keep my words. What's his words? If your eye be single, your body will fill with light. The kingdom of God is within you. Seek first the kingdom of God. You take away the key of knowledge because you don't enter within yourself. Cast your net to the right side. Okay? Take no thought. Take no thought. Take no thought. Take no thought. And Jesus is saying, if a man loves me, he'll keep my words. My Father will love him. We will come unto him and make our abode with him. So then, what he said is, the way that it's manifest is that God, the creator, that which is the Christ, will manifest itself in you because that which is God and Jesus or Christ consciousness will live in you. It's in your book. He explains exactly how this happened. So we've gone through the fact that he talked about the age of Aquarius. He said the kingdom does not come in such a way that you can see it, that you will know that he is in you, and that if you'll do what he says, in other words, meditation and entering within yourself, you will then develop the capacity to recognize that which is God and that which is the Christ dwelling in, inside of you. What is God's abode? Where does God live? Here it is. Look. What's it called? What? The temple. That's where he lives. And that's exactly what he's talking about. Look, go to page 933, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And verse 16. Here's the Apostle Paul. Know you not, in other words, don't you know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? What do we say this morning? What's God's name? I am. I am. Why? Because you are God. That's, that's, an, that's what you said this morning. That, that shakes people up. You know why you get shook up when somebody says you are God? Not because the Bible doesn't say it, because the Bible does say it. You get shook up when somebody says you are God because the system, puts, they don't want you to hear that. The system doesn't want you ever to feel that there is a God part of you which comes to life because then what happens to the system? When you realize you stand apart, away from the bondage of systems and religions, say, hey, I am special, then all of a sudden you find out you're not that worthless, rotten sinner, you know, that fakak, that a scuzzball, that come down here and get saved on your knee. You're not. All of a sudden you realize, I am. And that within you, that God part comes to life. You are, as Jesus said, the light of the world. And then Jesus turns around and says, Hey, the things that I do, you can do. You can do better than me. If I can do better than him, then I can say with him, and you can say with him, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. When we are able to break away from the thinking and the guilt and the fear and the depression of the system and begin to understand these words, then we are lifted up into that glory and into that righteousness and into that position that is truly ours. Not to be a worthless, rotten sinner, but to be that which is the manifestation of the living God himself. What's wrong with that? You know, you know the funny thing is? If you say, I am God, you're an occult sinner. But if you say, I'm a scuzzball, they say, that's right, hallelujah, brother, hallelujah. <laughs> you know, that's okay. You're nothing but a worthless, warped scuzzball. Amen, brother. Let's have an amen. It's a sinner. Just get on your knees and kiss the carpet and suck it up, kid. <laughs> that's what we like to hear, brother. But you say, I am God. I am Christ. Oh, no, you aren't, you evil wretch. I don't understand that. But that's what they do. See? So then the return of Christ is without a physical observation. But it says in Matthew 24, 30, in Revelation 1, 7, we will see the Son of Man coming in clouds. Hmm? Do you know that in mysticism, clouds means the unseen spirit? That's why when Moses went up to the mountain, God was always in clouds. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, we will be caught up together with him in the clouds. That means that we will be involved with him in the unseen spirit. And it says, and so we then will meet the Lord in the air. Air is the third stage of consciousness. I've been over this with you many times. 
The first stage of consciousness in Greek is earth. The second stage is water, which is truth. The third stage is air. The fourth stage is fire, and then the renewed mind. That's baptism. You take the earth, which is your lower mind, into the water, which is the truth. You rise out of the second stage of consciousness into the air, which is no thought. That's why people say people's airhead. No thought, nothing in there. When you rise into the air, that's the place where, when you take no thought, there is nothing there, then you are in the air. You're in the third stage of consciousness. From there you go up into the fourth stage, which is the fire of the Holy Spirit and the renewed mind. It has nothing to, but what do we do with it? What do we do with it? We, they build tanks and put garments and they shove them in the water. There is some man or some thing somewhere that will not get his ego unless you go in the water. And, and, and we used to do that, but we're, we're missing it. We're, 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 we're practicing the symbol instead of understanding the truth. This head, this mind, this carnal mind must go into the water, which is the mystic truth. When it goes into the water, which is the mystic truth, it will then start to raise itself up into the air, which is devoid of any thought. It is virgin consciousness, and in that place of virgin consciousness will come fire or the fourth stage of consciousness, and we will be touched by the Holy Spirit. That's baptism. Baptism has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with sticking your head in physical water any more than tithing has ever to do with giving 10% of your money any more than circumcision has anything to do with cutting <laughs> has nothing to do with it circumcision means cutting the outer desire tithing means giving that which is the 10% of the left side baptism means taking that which is your mind submitting it to the mystical truth and rising into the air of the third stage being touched don't you see John the Baptist was the preacher. He baptized with water. I'm the preacher. I'll baptize you with water. The second stage, I will take you to the mystical truth. But there is another who comes and baptizes with fire, who is the Christ, who touches you in the fourth stage. Don't you see? And so when you rise to meet him in the air, you are enveloped in the clouds of that which is the unseen spirit. That's right. So then the hope of the whole mystery of the universe is this, page 962. The book of Colossians. One that you don't get into that often, but this is what it is. The hope of the whole mystery of the universe is in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is what? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not Christ on a planet somewhere coming back with atomic bombs and a hail of bullets. How do we listen to this? How do, you know... Okay. Shh, shh. Are you, they didn't go anywhere? Okay. Let's pick it up where we left off. How? <laughs> Sometimes when you do it the second time, it's not as good. But how, how can we go into these churches? You did it all of you. Think of yourself. You're intelligent people. I am a reasonably intelligent person. And I went in these churches with you. And you know what they said? Put your money in. Sing Amazing Grace. And do nice things. And all of the good stuff is going to happen after you die. And we said, hallelujah, this is great. I said this morning, how would you like it if somebody said, hey, look, see this beautiful house in Malibu? Just pay $600 a, year, a month. I can have that for $600 a month? Sure, $600 a month, and then after you die, it's yours. What's so funny? This is exactly what you do. You pour into church and say, I'll take this. Hallelujah. Here's my money. Let's sing another song. I'll meet you up in glory. I'm going up today. I want to get on to see Jesus. I want to be on my way. And then the guy, the doctor comes and says, man, you got sick. <laughs> what happened? I thought you wanted to go meet Jesus. <sighs> I want to see a specialist. 
Because the, the point is that your urge is not to die to go see anybody, anyone. Your, your natural instinct urge is to live. Your natural instinct is to live and to do and to be part of that which is in you. I want to read you from the... How many times have you ever read the Egyptian Book of the Dead? Did you ever read that? It's a great book. Did you read it? Great. Listen to this. Homage to you, O oh you gods who dwell in the divine cloud and are exalted by reason of your scepters. So here, our Bible has Christ coming in clouds, and we being caught up in the clouds, and the ancient description book shows the divine aspects in the clouds from the Egyptian book of the dead. He comes in the clouds. This is from Vishnu of the Hindus. I, Lakshmi, reside in that cloud from which the waters of the rain pour down, in that cloud which is adorned with Indra's bow, and in that cloud from which the rays of lightning flash forth. They have a way of putting it, don't they? I mean, you've got to give it to them. They really do. And then it says in Matthew 24, 27, he comes as lightning which flashes from the east to the west. You know what that means? Every time you look north, east is at the right side. He comes as lightning means he comes as sudden enlightenment that comes from the right hemisphere to the left. Do you hear what I said? All of a sudden, wow, I know. Even tonight you say, wow. I understand. I know what he's coming. I know what the end of the age is. I know what his presence is going to be like. I know what's going on in the world and the universe today. I know why people are acting differently. Why? Because all of a sudden, from the east, from the right hemisphere, he has come like a bolt of lightning, and I'd say, I can see. I understand. I'm enlightened. I'm aware. So we rise to meet him in the air, which is the higher mental plane. There's a... Yeah, do you know much about the Sikh religion? Have you ever seen these guys who have these turbans on their head? This is Sikh religion. This is, the water is our father. The great earth is our mother. The air is our guru. Huh? You know what that? When you come and sit in meditation and you lift yourself up into that absolute nothingness of nirvana, you're lifting yourself up into the air. We shall rise to meet Jesus in the air. That's where the guru is. That's where the teacher is. That's where the leading comes from. That's the second coming of Christ. This is the second coming of Christ. To be a conqueror and to, and to survive in this world and to understand what's going on. And to realize it doesn't make you see what the you know what the hardest thing you've got to do you have somehow you have you've got to you, you you somehow you've got to take that which has chained you to the system and cut that chain and you've got to stand out completely you've got to get as far away from the system as you can possibly get far away from it and you've got to stand on your own and you've got to stand deep into the meditation and keep raising that consciousness up to that air and then be absolutely sure that Jesus knew what the heck he was talking about, that Krishna knew what he was talking about, that Buddha knew what he was talking about, and that this works. To conquer the world and its problems with determination, you've got to be very determined. But the most important thing you can do is surrender. Surrender is not impotence. Surrender is a tremendous power that you are absolutely giving yourself to this holy place within. Because each one of us have lived the other way, and you know where the result is. It's nothing. There's no possibilities. East and west together, you surrender that all may be one. You rise up into the clouds, and in that unseen spirit, he touches you. He, the eternal mother, father, God, touches you within yourself. And you don't have to spend a dime. You don't have to go to a church. You don't have to join anything. That's not the, part, that's not the problem here. All of the churches, all of the organizations, they've gotten together in groups, and they've attacked the other group, and this group has attacked that group, and they've split you into all kinds of, of separate walls around you to keep you away from them, to keep you... And as I said this morning, people say, oh, I don't want to hear anything about Krishna. I don't want to hear anything about Buddha. You know, it's not that they don't want to hear what Krishna or Buddha said, because they don't know what the heck either of them said. All they know is they have a racial prejudice against them because they are attached to a particular culture that is foreign to ours. It's all separation, whether it be against women, whether it be against nature, whether it be against people from different cultures, it's all the same thing. I don't want any of that in my house, simply saying, I don't want those people near me. 
because you have sat here and you've heard the teachings of Buddha, you've heard the teachings of Krishna, you've heard the teachings of Jesus, and you know it's all the same, it's all the same, it's all the one teaching. But when you say, I accept, then you accept the culture, you accept the people, all is one, and you take the hand of the Hindu, or you take the hand of the Buddhist, or you take the hand of the Sikh, or you take the hand of the Muslim, or whomever you take the hand, and you just build a tremendous circle around Mother Earth, and then you bring together this oneness that you, you have to be one with all, one with life, one with peace, one with nature. But you can't do it if you join a group and say, we're against you, our way is right, your way is wrong. I saw, I was watching this thing tonight that Joe and Rose gave about this fundamentalist, uh, Christian fundamentalist church or school, college. They don't allow blacks and, and whites or whites and Asians to, to date. Don't allow it. You say, say, well, we treat everybody equal, but we don't allow that. And, 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 and until you become totally blind to the differences. So, well, God created them different. Nature creates differences. Certainly nature creates differences. But the beautiful part of our test of life and karma is to overcome the differences and to be one with everybody. And it has to come that way, and it's getting much closer to coming that way in life for all of us. So that's the second coming of Christ. And I hope that maybe you get from the evidence that you've seen a little better understanding of what Jesus is talking about when he says, I am in you, and during the age of the water man, you will find me in that large upper room. Go there. Prove it to him. I can't prove it to you. You don't have to prove anything to me. But if you will go there, you'll find him. He promised he would be there. Remember, that's a date. Did you think of that? That's a date. You have a date. He said, I want to tell you something. As soon as you see the man with the pitcher of water, go into the house, go to the upper room, and I will meet you there. He promised you have a date. Do you know how few people have chosen to keep that date? Oh, bumper stickers, honk if you love Jesus. Go to church, study the Bible. But don't go into that house and go to the upper room. And unless you do, unless you do, you can't celebrate the Passover. And the Passover is when you lift off and overwhelm all of those hurts and all of the things which have made your life difficult. This system, this government, any government on the face of the earth will do nothing to make your life easier. Whether it be insurance companies or whether it be uh, uh, politicians, whomever. They're not doing anything to make your life easier, but he will. And it's going to change around. The social order will change. Right. Whether it be for women, whether it be for minority people, whether it be for the earth, it doesn't make any difference. The only way it can come is when everybody starts to obey and keep that date. So now the man with the water has been seen. You know that. You're an Aquarius. So if you want to fulfill his date with you, get inside the house and go to the upper room, and he'll meet you there. And I can guarantee you that he will because he didn't make any promises he couldn't keep. He's waiting there right now. Sometimes you hear the dishes rattling up here, don't you? I do. Marbles rattling, dishes, the same thing. Well, why don't you go inside and go upstairs and see who's there? Because the man with the water pitcher has announced his arrival. The second coming is here, inside of you. Thank you for sharing the time.